it's pretty easy for us to be enticed with new. Like a new car. A new home. This is cute. A new job. <laughs> a new trend. A new look. A new you. Nope. And maybe that's not a bad thing. Because our creator seems to be all about new. Like a new promise. A new command. mercies, and even a new year. God not only loves new, but promises to make all things new. And we are invited into the sacred work. All right, if you've got a Bible with you, Romans chapter 8 is where we will be. If not, all the verses will be on the uh, screens here, and you can follow along with us there. Um, while you're finding that, um, a, a little bit of sad family news I wanted to um, give you guys. Um, if you're part of the Garnock family, you know Miss Marilyn Cooper. Last night, her son Jimmy um, passed away and went to be with the Lord. And so um, let me encourage you to just be praying for Miss Marilyn and the rest of their family um, in the coming days. Um, burying a child, obviously that's something that nobody should ever have to endure. I don't think there's probably a pain that is any greater than that. So be praying for her um, in this season. The, the good news is that we serve a God who knows what it's like to lose a child. Uh, the Bible says God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. And, and so while that's an unimaginable type of pain and grief, it is a type of pain and grief that, that we believe God walks with us through. So be praying for Miss Marilyn. Keep her and um, that family in your prayers, that God's presence would just be with them and cover them and give them peace in the coming days. And for those of you who know Miss Marilyn, um, let me just encourage you to reach out to her in the next couple days and, and let her know that, that they are in your thoughts and prayers. But Romans chapter 8, we're continuing our series, uh, New Year, New You, looking through uh, Romans 6 through 8 at what does it look like to really change? What does it mean to be made new when we come to faith in Christ and Jesus saves us? So today we get into chapter 8, um, which we're going to be in for the next three weeks. Romans chapter 8 um, has been said by many to be the greatest chapter in the entire Bible. A lot of people say it's the richest, deepest, just most incredible chapter in the entire Bible. Paul, who writes the book of, book of Romans, um, I, I really do think he was a genius. He, he's a brilliant author in his own right. Yeah, all of the writings Paul of all of the writings of Paul are absolutely incredible. But there's just something about Romans eight that I think stands above the rest of them. Romans eight to Paul, it, it's like Abbey Road for the Beatles, or it, it's like you know Jordan's flu game um, during the finals against the Jazz. It's like the Sistine Chapel for Michelangelo, right? Romans chapter 8 is just a genius who is operating at their just top peak performance. It's incredible what he says here. So we're going to be looking at it for the next three weeks. Hopefully I don't butcher it, um, because where Paul's a genius, I am absolutely not. So hopefully I can do it a little bit of justice by the grace of God. So Romans 8, we're going to pick it up in verse 1. Paul starts, he says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Amen. Yeah, y'all better say amen at that. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. So again, Paul here right off the bat starts with this massive, massive, massive statement. He says, now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. So condemnation here is kind of a legal term. It refers to guilt, but in this context, it specifically refers to guilt for sin. Sin, the Bible tells us, it's any action, it's any thought, it's any deed, it's any inclination of the heart that would ever contradict God's will, that would ever contradict anything that God says for us. 
And the Bible tells us that the, the penalty or the punishment, the sentence for being declared guilty of sin is death. Right? It's both physical death here in this life, but it's also eternal death where we are separated from God forever. And so Paul spends the first several chapters of Romans kind of unpacking that truth. Uh, cluing us in on this bad news, but on this true bad news that if we die and we stand before God on our own account, or if we stand before God on our own merit, right? If we are judged according to our lives and our actions, Paul has said that we are all going to stand guilty of sin before God, right? In Romans 3, Paul has said, everybody has sinned. And then in chapter 6, he said, and then the punishment or the wages, as he calls it, for that sin is death, right? So he has unpacked already in this book that if on our own we are to stand before God, if we die, stand before God for judgment, and we are judged based on us, then he said we're all going to be guilty. We are all going to be condemned of sin and sentenced to eternal separation from God. But here in chapter 8, he starts by unleashing this just amazing, beautiful, magnificent truth that he says, but now, right? So he says, that's true. If you stand before God on your own, there's condemnation. But now, there is no condemnation for anyone who belongs to Christ Jesus. And so here, Paul is talking about what um, theologians and what Bible nerds have called justification, Right? Justification is kind of a, a fancy um, church word that means that you are right with God. Justification essentially deals with you and I being freed from the penalty of sin. It, justification deals with our being spared from the penalty of sin. So that's what justification is. Justification is we have been freed from the penalty of sin. Then starting in verse 5, Paul's going to talk about what people call sanctification. Right? Sanctification refers to the slow process over the course of our lives where we slowly but steadily grow and change and are transformed to look more and more like Jesus. Right? So to use those same terms, sanctification deals with our being freed from the power of sin. Right? So again, if you're tracking justification, that's us being freed from the penalty of sin, the penalty that sin deserves. Sanctification is we are gradually, over the course of our lives, being freed from the power that sin has on our lives. And then in the second half of chapter 8, which we're going to get into next week, Paul goes on and he talks about what theologians call glorification. This is that day that's coming in the future when Christ returns and we will one day live with him forever in his kingdom. And in that day, we will be freed from the presence of sin once and for all. That God will do away with sin and death forever. So those are kind of the three stages of our salvation that Paul is addressing in chapter 8, right? I know it's kind of nerdy and stuff, but, but hopefully you're tracking with me. So first, our justification, right? We are freed from the penalty of sin. And then as we're going to see in a minute, our sanctification, we are being freed from the power of sin. And then what we're going to see next week, ultimately one day there's going to be our glorification where we are freed from the presence of sin once and for all. But again, here in verses 1 through 4, he's talking about our justification, that we are no longer guilty of sin before God. That if we are in Christ, when we stand before God, we will not have to pay the penalty for our sin. That's what he's talking about when he says there is now no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus. So then the question is, okay, well, how in the world could that be? Because I have sinned, right? And you have sinned. We are actually guilty of sin. So how is it that we can stand before God and God will look at us and declare people who are actually guilty to be not guilty? How is that possible, right? That's what he talks about in verse 3. He says he, talking about the Father, God the Father, he sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. And Paul is saying that what happened is that God the Father sent God the Son, Jesus, that God the Son became human, and he lived in a body just like you and I live in. And in that human body, Jesus faced all of the same temptations that you and I face in this life. But unlike us, whereas we give in to sin, where we give in to temptation, Jesus succeeded in resisting sin. He never gave in to temptation. 
Right? The, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians that he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. And so by living perfectly where we could not, where by fulfilling God's law perfectly that we could not, Jesus was able to take our place, he was able to go to the cross and die, paying the penalty that our sin deserved. He took our place. And so Paul's whole point here in verses 1 through 4 is that if you belong to Jesus, Jesus already paid for your sin. He took our sin onto himself even though he was sinless. And he was basically tried before God, and God declared that sin guilty when Jesus took it on himself. And Jesus died paying the penalty for our sin. He paid it all. And so Paul says, so now there is no condemnation left for you. He's saying that you cannot be put back on trial. You cannot be tried for the crimes that Jesus was already tried and convicted of and that he paid for. He already paid it all. It's done. According to God's legal system, it's over and paid. Any of y'all remember um, that movie, Double Jeopardy, from back in the 90s? I, I, I remember watching that with my dad as a kid, and I remembered it being awesome. I watched the trailer for it this week, and now looking back, like with you know time gone by, I'm like, man, this movie looks terrible. It looks so cheesy. But remember, back in the day, it was a great movie. So this movie, Double Jeopardy, it, it's based on this legal concept called Double Jeopardy. And um, you know, Jacob is an attorney. Tell me after if I'm butchering this. But from what I understand, Double Jeopardy, it's this legal concept that says, well, once you are tried for a crime, and once you're either convicted or acquitted of that crime, it's done, it's over. And no matter what happens after that, no matter if there's new evidence or anything like that, they can never go back and retry you for that same crime once the sentence has already been handed down. So in this movie, what happens is Ashley Judd, um, she's the star of it. She wakes up, her husband's gone, and she's covered in his blood. Right? So the police come and arrest her for her husband's murder. She gets tried, convicted, and sent to jail. The thing is, is she didn't murder her husband. He framed her. He set this whole thing up so he could run off from her and cash in on the life insurance. So she goes, she's sent it, she's in prison. But while she's in prison, she finds out that her husband is still alive. And not only that, her cellmate clues her in that, hey, there's this little law called double jeopardy, which means if you ever get out of prison, you can actually go and murder your husband because you were already convicted of it. So they can't charge you for that again. They can't try you for it again. So six, seven years later, she gets paroled and Tommy Lee Jones is trying to chase her down because she's going trying to track down her husband and murder him because now there's double jeopardy. She can get away with it. So that's what double jeopardy is. Paul here, when he says there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus, I think Paul is saying that in God's legal system, God has a double jeopardy law. Right? That once God declares a verdict, there's no going back on it. He's not going back on his word. That once he has declared Christ guilty for our sin and judged Christ for our sin and Christ paid the penalty for our sin, God then looked at us and said, well, they are not guilty. Because Jesus took our judgment onto himself. And so once God declares us not guilty, there's no going back on that. There is no condemnation. Because all of that was already paid for. So, listen, if you belong to Christ, and, and that's the key here, by the way. Paul says there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Right? This is so important. Paul doesn't say, hey, there's no condemnation for those who are members of a church. He doesn't say there's no condemnation for those whose grandpa was a deacon. He doesn't say there's no condemnation for those who you know, have a quiet time or who give their money or who do all these goodies. He doesn't say any of that. He says, no, there's no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus. That's the question. Not are you religious, not do you attend church, not do you do some good deeds, but do you belong to Jesus? That's what it all hinges upon. But, but look at what he says. He says, if you belong to Jesus then Jesus was already punished for all of your sin. And if Jesus was already punished for all of our sin, then there will not be a moment in your existence anymore that God is ever punishing you for your sin. Because if God punished Jesus for our sin, and then God decides to also punish us 
for our sin, then God would be being unjust towards Jesus. And the Bible tells us that God is a just God. There's not an ounce of injustice found in Him. Jesus was punished on the cross for the sins of those who belong to Him, so we will never be punished by God again. Now, with that, quick aside. This does not mean that as the children of God, God won't sometimes discipline us. He will. The Bible tells us He disciplines those He loves. Right? But discipline is completely different than punishment. Dif- discipline is completely different than condemnation. Right? I think of like if you've got a toddler and they're roaming around and they're going and trying to stick a paper clip into a power socket. Right? They're a toddler. They don't know what they're doing. So you're not going to punish them per se. You're not going to condemn them. You're not angry at them. Right? They're just being a toddler. But what you are going to do is you're going to go over and you're going to smack their hand a little bit. Right? Again, not as punishment. Not as condemnation, but as discipline. It's a way to say, hey, no, don't do that. You don't understand. That's not going to be as fun as you think it is. That's going to lead you somewhere that you don't want to go. Please don't touch that. In the same way, as God's children, God will sometimes lovingly smack our hands as discipline. Say, hey, no, don't touch that. Don't go there. That, that's not going to lead where you think it's going to lead. You don't want to do that. He does that out of a loving heart as a father. So he will discipline his children, but God does not punish his children because Jesus already took that punishment for us. I mean, don't miss this. This is huge. Those of us who belong to Jesus, when God the Father looks at us, there is not an ounce of condemnation left in his heart toward us. Not a single ounce. Paul says there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, if you're like me and you're kind of like a cynic or a skeptic at heart and you tend to kind of struggle and wrestle with things like this and you tend to think, man, like, could God really be that good? That just seems like way, way, way too good to be true. Like, I'll tell you when I read that what I think. What I think is like, okay, well, I, I get how there wouldn't be any condemnation for all the sins that I committed before I became a Christian. I get how there could be grace and mercy and forgiveness for all of those. But like, what about the millions of sins that I've committed after I became a Christian? Right beforehand, I didn't know any better, so I see how God could overlook those and forgive me for those. But like, after I've been a Christian, all the sins I committed then, it's like I should have known better by that point. I should have been stronger. I should have said no to sin. I don't know. It feels like God's still going to condemn me for those sins I committed after I came to faith in Christ. Well, Paul, this same guy in Ephesians 1.4, Paul says that before God made the world, so think about that, before God made the world, Paul says he knew you and he loved you and he chose you in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. What Paul is saying there is that before God laid the foundations of the universe, before any of this existed, God already knew, looking down the corridor of history, He already knew every single sin you and I ever would commit. And having the knowledge of that, knowing that He was still pleased to send His Son Jesus to pay for every single last one of them. So now, as Paul says, we can know that there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. So so that's our justification, that because of what Jesus has done, we are saved from the penalty that we deserve because of our sin. So now Paul's going to move on to our sanctification, or how we are gradually being saved from the power of sin in our lives. So he goes on in verse 5. He says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and never will. That's why those who are under the control of their sinful nature cannot please God. So here he's talking about our lives before Jesus saves us. He's talking about our lives before we receive that forgiveness of our sin. And he's saying, in that state, sin has power over us. Sin controls us. We don't have the power to fight and resist sin. But then in verse 9, he starts talking about the new life in Christ. He says, but you now are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. 
And remember, those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you so that even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. Therefore, this is key, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. So again, Paul's big idea here is that before we come to faith in Christ, before Jesus saves us, we are bound to sin. We are slaves to sin. That we don't have power in us to resist sin. The power of sin and temptation is far too strong for us. But he says, and that's what he's saying starting in verse 9, he says, when we come to faith in Christ, there is a new power that lives in us. There is a new power that controls us. And that new power is stronger than the power of sin. That new power gives us the ability to resist sin. And he says that power that lives in us is the very Spirit of God. That when Jesus saves us, the Spirit of God comes to live within us the moment we are saved. Right? And now there's, there's some people who love Jesus, but um, I believe they get this wrong and, and they believe that, well, you know, you can be saved but not have the Holy Spirit. Right? Some people think, well, you, you're saved at one moment in time, but then sometime in the future down the road, if you get lucky, then you receive the Holy Spirit. So you know, there's kind of like two classes of Christians. There's like the varsity Christians who have the Holy Spirit, and then like your JV until you get the Holy Spirit. But that's not what Paul says at all here. Look again at verse 9. He says, remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them don't belong to Him at all. Paul says emphatically, if you have put your faith and hope and trust in Jesus, if you belong to Jesus, listen, God's Spirit is living in you. You have the power of the Spirit of God in your life. And when he says living in you, in his language, it's a term that literally means to take residence. It literally means to dwell in. It means that the Holy Spirit moves in and takes over your life. Right? I, I remember... Um, when Christy and I got married, and she took up residence in my apartment, right? You know, the apartment of a single bachelor looks pretty different from the apartment of a married man, right? Uh, because before she took up residence, like, you know, it's like dining table. Who needs a dining table, right? I've got TV trays. I can sit in the living room and watch my new flat screen that's not on an entertainment center, but it's just sitting on the box it came in because that's more economical. Like, you know, we can just do dinner there. You don't need all this fancy stuff. And it's like before she took up residence, like the concept of taking a dirty dish and putting it right in the dishwasher, it's like, who would ever think of that? Like, that's insane. That doesn't make any sense. But you see, when she took up residence in my apartment, man, things started to change. Slowly but surely, things started to look different, started to change. Paul would say that's what happens when, when the Spirit takes up residence in our life, that the Spirit comes in and, and He takes over. He starts cleaning up the mess. He empowers us and things start to change. And so what Paul says here is, is the big thing that changes is that the Spirit empowers us with the ability to now resist sin. Remember verse 5, he says, before Christ, the power of sin is too great. We can't fight it. We don't stand a chance against it. Now he's saying the power of the Spirit frees us to resistance. So verse 12 again, it says, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. See, whereas in our sinful nature, we can't resist sin. Now we have the power of the Spirit in us, and He is empowering us to resist sin. Right, that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians that, that God will not allow His people to face any temptation that through His Spirit they cannot withstand. That if you have the Spirit of God living in you, there is no temptation we can face that we don't have the strength to withstand. To withstand. 
Right? The way that our sanctification works, the way that it works that gradually, slowly but surely, over the course of a lifetime, we start to grow and change and look more and more like Jesus. The way that it works is that God's Spirit takes up residence in our life and He empowers us to fight sin. Now, now real quick, notice this. We realize that, again, our justification, going back to the, what he talked about, verses 1 through 4, that we are freed from the penalty of sin. We all realize, right, that our justification is nothing but an act of God's grace. We get that we are justified because of God's grace, that we can't earn it, we don't deserve it, it's nothing we do. It's all an act of God's goodness and grace that He bestows on us. We get that our justification is an act of grace, but sometimes we miss that our sanctification is just as much an act of God's grace. Because again, if the way that we grow, if the way that we become more and more like Jesus is by the Holy Spirit taking up residence and the Holy Spirit empowering us to change and grow and become more like Jesus, then who's the active party actually doing the growing in our life? It's the Holy Spirit. It's God doing the work in us. Our sanctification is just as much an act of grace as our justification is. It's all an act of God's goodness and His mercy and His grace on us. Uh, but you see, Paul here, he doesn't, he doesn't want us to think that just because our growth, just because our sanctification is a gift of God's grace, he doesn't want us to think that we don't play an active role in it because we absolutely do play an active role in it. Verse 13 again. He says, For if you live by sin's dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit, so notice it's all through the power of the Spirit, it's not our power, it's God's power. But if, through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, then you will live. He says the way we play an active role is that we are empowered by the Spirit of God to play this role in putting our sin to death. One old dead theologian said it this way. He said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And I love that. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Paul says sin leads to death and destruction. So through the power of the Spirit, we must play an active role in putting our sin to death. Right? I, I, I'm a huge sports fan, right? But um, one of kind of those sports cliches that I absolutely hate is defense wins championships. Right? You hear that all the time, right? People say, oh, defense wins championships. I hate that line. Because while sometimes there's exceptions and sometimes it's true, generally speaking, that's not true at all. Offense wins championships, right? Who is the same one player that's been in like half the Super Bowls this century? Tom Stinkin' Brady, right? Does he play offense or defense? He plays offense, all right? I looked it up this week just to make sure that I'm not misleading you or lying to you. If you take the four teams that are playing today that are left in the NFL playoffs, of those four teams, all four of them are in the top half statistically this year in offense. All four of the teams left are in the top half statistically in offense. Only one of them is in the top half in defense. Offense wins championships. I'll get off my soapbox with that. But here's why I tell you that. I'm afraid that sometimes that same mindset, right, this mindset of defense wins championships, kind of works its way into our spiritual lives. And if it does, it's incredibly dangerous. And what I mean is sometimes in our Christian lives, we'll say, okay, well, yes, sin's going to come, temptation's going to come, but I just need to sit back and I kind of need to wait for it to come. And when it comes, I need to play defense and fight against it and resist it. No, Paul says we need to go on the attack. Right? We need to go on the offensive. We need to be actively engaged in putting our sin to death. We need to be on the offense. Now, you're probably like, okay, well, that sounds great and all, but what in the world does that look like practically? How in the world do I put my sin to death practically? Again, Paul, the guy who writes this, he, he's an absolute brilliant author. So he gives us the answer in Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians 6, He's talking about what it looks like to fight against sin, to fight against our enemy Satan, to resist temptation. And so he uses this metaphor of putting on the armor of God. If you grew up in church, this is a familiar passage for you. But this is what Paul says. He says, so stand your ground. Talking about stand your ground against Satan and sin and temptation. He says, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. <clears throat> 
In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. So, so far in that, you notice that there's not any weapons listed, right? It's talking about put on a belt, put on body armor, put on shoes, put on a helmet, put on a shield. You don't go and kill somebody with those things, right? Those are all defensive measures. But look at what he says next. The one offensive weapon in this entire analogy. He says, and take the sword... I said, now we're talking about a weapon. Now he's talking about something that can actually be used to put something to death. And then notice he says, the sword of what? The sword of the Spirit. Remember back in Romans, he said it's by the power of what? The Spirit that we're putting sin to death. So he says, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So what Paul says is the way that we actively put sin to death in our lives is through this. Right? It's through the Word of God. It's through trusting that what God says in His Word is true and it's good and that He knows better than we do. It's by believing that what God's Word says is true. It's by feasting on God's Word. Man, I, I would say even I know that this is kind of like maybe seems old school and, and dated and out of touch now, but you know, back growing up in church, back in the 80s and 90s, you know, as a kid we made a big deal about memorizing Scripture. Man, I, I think that's something that's still so vitally important. That's one way that we rely on the Word of God and use the Word of God to put sin to death. We memorize the Word of God. This is why it matters so much that, that we, as followers of Jesus, are daily spending time in God's Word. Not, not because it's a duty. And not because if we like miss our morning devotion, God's angry at us or He's mad or disappointed. No. But it is so important that we are spending time in His Word because this Word is the weapon that we use to put sin to death. This is why it matters so greatly that we gather together weekly to open up His Word and community and hear it taught. This is why it matters that you get into community with a small group of people, with, with a handful of people who are believers, so that you can talk through and, and unpack what this means in your individual lives. Right, this matters. This book is the weapon that we use to put sin and temptation to death. Now, before Paul kind of closes out this section and gets into glorification, again, that, that day coming in the future when Christ returns and He will free us forever from the presence of sin, he, he closes with this one last idea. And this kind of last idea that he closes with here kind of seems random and it seems out of place in the flow of a thought that he's going here with. But this is how Paul closes this kind of teaching on justification and sanctification. He goes on in verse 14. He says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him Abba, Father. Paul closes this section here by saying those who belong to Christ, God has adopted as his own children. And as the children of God, we now call him Abba. Now, Abba was not a proper term in this language that referred to father. Abba was kind of like a slang term for father that implied intimacy. There were many other words that Paul could have used here for the word father, but he chose to use this slang word, Abba. The most literal translation in our English language would be like daddy or papa. That's the word for father that Paul uses here. He says, now we can call God daddy. Now, who calls their father daddy? A little kid, right? Little kids call their father, daddy. Man, as, as, a, uh, as a parent, like the saddest day in the life of a parent is when your kids get a little bit older and they walk up to you for the first time and instead of saying dad, daddy, they say dad. Right? Those of you who are parents, like, isn't that like the worst thing ever? When they stop saying daddy and instead they say dad. Right? It's so impersonal, so unintimate. Right, but when they're little, right, when, when they are young, when they're at that age where in their mind you could do no wrong, where like you are perfect and you're the strongest person in the world and you know everything, when they're at that beautifully ignorant little age, 
And then you've been gone all day and they haven't seen you all day. And then you come home and they see you and they come running through the door and throw their arms up and scream, Daddy! And there is nothing better than that. Paul is saying here, that's what we have in our relationship with God. Not just kind of an impersonal type of father, but an Abba. A father that we can run up to and throw our arms up to and say, Daddy, and he picks us up and squeezes us as tight as he can. That's what Paul says we have in God the Father. Now again, as I read that, at first it's like, that's beautiful, Paul. That's great. That's incredible. Thanks for sharing. But what in the world does that have to do with everything else you just said, right? It seems random and out of place, doesn't it? He's talking about this whole justification thing. We're saved from the penalty of sin. He's talking about this sanctification thing that his, God's Spirit empowers us to fight against and resist sin. That's all great. But then what does that have to do with the fact that, that we have a God that we can run up to and He holds us in His arms like a little child? How does this tie in? And I think here's why Paul does this. I think it's because Paul knows that what our inclination is going to be in our spiritual lives, in our walk with Jesus, is that God's Spirit is going to grow us. He is going to transform us. He is going to change us. But in our fallen, sinful bodies, we're going to take two steps forward and one step back. All right? I'm not alone in that, right? Is that how it is for you too, spiritually? Like you take two steps forward in growth and then you take one step back. That's how it typically is for us. And I think Paul realizes that. Paul gets that. And Paul knows that our inclination is going to be that when that happens, when we take that step backwards, we are going to tend to think that God's angry with us, that God's done with us, that God doesn't want us anymore. But he wants to remind us as he closes that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so when we take that one step back, since there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, God is not like a traffic cop in heaven waiting to write us a ticket. He's not like some cosmic Santa Claus writing down all the bad that we did to transfer our name from the nice list to the naughty list. That's not God our Father. Paul wants us to know that even when we blow it, even when we fall short, even when we take that step backwards, we still have a Father who loves us and we can run into His arms because there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.